Welcome to the ATP Project. Thanks, You're with Steve. your hosts, oh. Steve, Matt, and Elisma. And today we're talking about macro mysteries. Well, what's a macro? Macro is like a protein. It's a mystery, fat. Steve. It's a mystery. Yeah, <laughs> we won't tell them. It's a mystery. <laughs> That's it. Work it out. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I mean, macros are just like those, those headaches that, that nutritionists and naturopaths have wrestled with because what's the ideal macro ratio? What's yeah. the ideal amount of protein, fats, which fats, which protein? So we're talking about ices. the macronutrients that make up our calories? Yep. That determine whether we're in a calorie deficit or a calorie surplus. And yep. this is the whole thing that's confused us the whole time. Absolutely. Now, now what is well, a calorie? confused me, which is why I'm so glad I've got a couple of experts here to talk about it. It's confusing so, for everybody. It's yeah. not just we've got to remember a calorie is is a unit of energy used to to, That's to a raise cup of water, Steve. Yes. Why are you, a, well, let me finish. Doing, a, a calorie is the energy required to raise one litre of water by one degree Celsius. Oh really? Yeah, that's what a calorie. That's calorific. Yeah, it's calorific, and that's what it gets. What a kilocalorie, or it's we in nutrition calls it large C calorie. Hey, I'm glad you said that. Did you ever work? That really confused me. What's yes. the go with a calorie when you're looking at burning something in yep. a crucible with like a little C? Yeah. And then we got the kilocalories yeah. with the big C, but we just call them calories. Yeah, exactly. It it, it came. It started with Clement back in in 1824. Who? What? Clement. Why? He was a he was a French French scientist. Oh, that guy. Yeah. yeah. And and he was a steam scientist. So back then, steam engines were the go. Oh, so yeah. how much energy is required what? to? <laughs> What did you say? What? Oh, no, that's, clever. That, that's power. No, no, what? Didn't he invent the first steam engine? Who, what? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It was a long time ago, the old steam engine. No, it led to the train. Yeah. I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, 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 so how much energy is required to heat up water to make steam? And this is what a calorie is. It's, it's a little c calorie is one gram of water or one centimetre cube to raise by one degree. A yeah. large C calorie, the ones that nutritionists use, yeah. is one litre of water, which is actually a kilocalorie. But we don't call them kilocalories. No, so they're called, called large C calories. calories. Yeah, so yeah. nutritionists call calories um, like large C calories is yeah. what we refer to, which is the same as kilojoules. Oh, shit, now we're Because I was going to ask you that next. What's the go with a kilojoule? A kilojoule is, is what they call an SI unit or yeah. a standard international or a metric. And that means it's 4.18 kilojoules to one large C of calorie. Of course. Now, isn't this an interesting way to start a podcast? <laughs> yes. We're listing As everyone's asleep after capitals two minutes. and numbers yep. and letters. So basically, we've worked out that someone here knows what a calorie is. Yeah, well, I didn't. Like, I was it's like... It's confusing, hey? I, I, you know, it's the, the, I saw the K-cal, yeah. you yeah. know, what you see in... Yeah, so what's K-cal? Like, K-cal? Is a that K- a big C? Yeah, that, that's the same as a big C calorie. Gosh. Yeah, that's I didn't exactly know that. K, yeah. K is the universal standard for a 1,000. Yeah. And you've got to remember a litre came from a, a, a centimetre cubed by 10, which is, you know, a litre. Yeah. And, and that came from the metre, which, of course, is the circumference or the distance from the equator to the North Pole. So it all started from that back in the 17th century. God, he knows some weird stuff, Shit. doesn't well, he? Well, you know, you know what the distance from the equator to the North Pole is? It's 10,000 10, kilometres by definition. Straight? As the bird flies? As the bird flies, through Paris. That's like, how they measure it. It's kind of cur- oh, Are we talking yeah, flat cur- or no, round? No, curvature, rounder. <laughs> all right, all right. Just check. Start, started with Copernicus. It'd be in the easier to century. measure if it was flat. Yeah, yeah, straight line through it. But so that, that's where all the units came from. So units of measurements and calories, just how much energy is required to heat it up. Now you, Isn't you it asked weird you, that they just changed it though. Just to, it went from kilocal like everything else. Like yeah. imagine if the guy that decided to invent kilometres just said oh, just, let's just use a capital M <laughs> yeah so like and right? we got metres little metres and yeah. then big metres yeah no, nah, it's stupid like, that's weird that it's they have stupid. that so anyway so we've worked out what a calorie is yep. it's a calorific value associated it's a unit with, of energy I just want to say calorific like yeah. many times isn't that a cool <laughs> word a word we don't get to say very much we don't. next time I see a cake I'm going man that's calorific yes <laughs> <laughs> so, so you asked a great question like Thank what's you. the difference because when, when, when you burn a calorie and you can measure how many calories in it by how much energy is given off when you mm-hmm. ignite it. Yeah. Okay. But does that happen in the human body, or oh. is it something different? Yeah. Well, it, well, it would have to, wouldn't it? I mean, if it if it yields a certain amount of energy, yep. it yields that amount of energy. Yep. That what we're probably looking at is the net energy yep. left over. Yes. You know, because when in our body we've got to consider how much energy is used in digestion. Yes. And absorption, all those absorption. things take energy, and, is and it then absorbed? the transport. Yeah. And if it's not absorbed, mm. who gets that energy? Well, it's still burnt at a crucible, so it's still got those calories. Yeah, I'm not shitting in a crucible. No, of course. So if I'm not absorbing it, then I can definitely measure the calorific value of my poop. 
yeah. um, in a crucible, yeah. but that doesn't actually affect. But I've eaten those calories, and this is where it'll get confusing because if I'm trying to ca- measure my calories on a plate, I mean, it's confusing mm. enough to work out how many calories we need, for starters. I, that, we'll talk about that later. And I think, actually, we may not even talk about that at all today because I think we'll get on, we'll get on like Rick Kreider and, and Bill Campbell and those mm. experts that, me, not that these aren't experts, but they have the tools. They've got the toys that actually measure calories. And they got, we'll have a, that'll be in a story in itself. So today we're trying to work out how to calculate the calories on the plate. And it's bloody confusing. Yeah. And it gets to the point where... I don't think anyone knows, honestly, in, in an individual case, everyone's so different because mm. we've got to consider the other thing we haven't even mentioned yet is that your microbiome may get it first mm. and they may decide that I, they want to burn the energy or they may decide that they want you to be bigger as a bigger vehicle so they can give you the energy. Like, So we've got to talk about all this. So we're going to work out, for starters, when you're looking at your plate, what are those calories, how mm. many of those calories are going to get into your body mm. and... Then we're going to talk about those weird stuff like, um, yeah, people say negative calories. Mm. Yeah, some foods, you know, take more calories to process. Yeah, like which to me, is it and a food? And yeah. Is it still a food if it actually gives you nothing like that? Mm. So, um, so we'll talk about all that. And then there's all these other confusing stuff like resistant starches yep. and everything. So, where do we start? So with the macros, let's oh, yeah. forget about working out your calorie burn. I don't want to talk too much about BMRs resting metabolic rate and all that sort of stuff. So we will talk little bits as we go, but let's start with let's start with protein. You wanna? Protein, sure. Should we have a look at protein first? Yeah, because yeah, it's do. bloody confusing to I am so confused over so much of this. I mean I'm I'm not even joking because the other thing that confuses me a lot is every country's got different laws around how to label the nutrition. Yes. So like yeah. we actually have different calorie values of one food product for different countries because they have decided on different laws relating to like how we label this stuff because some of them say this won't give you energy like protein with amino acids someone says the amino acids are going to give you the energy but they say no you're just tricking people to buying amino acids because you're too lazy to give them protein so we won't let you label amino acids as protein we have to make them separate then the other people are talking about peptides going well they're like found in proteins and their combinations of amino acids where do they sit and then i want to look at protein in regards to structural (laughs) like we got some protein that's incorporated into structural tissue we may may not be burning that as a fuel Mm -hmm. um we also know amino acids go into brain chemistry neurotransmitters Mm -hmm. they're needed for liver detoxification thyroid function thyroid function so you've got all these actual roles so when is a protein what's the calorific I didn't get to say it. What's a calorific value of protein? Four. Large C. Four. Per gram. Don't you? And, of course, carbohydrates have four and fats have nine. So, therefore, we've got to have started on a low-fat diet to lose calories. Is that right? Oh, shit, Steve. You've just thrown me now. I asked a very <laughs> bloody simple question. And I said four. How many ca- Oh, yeah, you did say that, actually. And, then, and, then, <laughs> and I even held then up Then I four. took a sip of coffee and he used that opportunity <laughs> to ramble on about everything else. No, I was just fucking with you. <laughs> so, we're getting four yeah. out yeah. of protein. But four grams. are we really? So, you know, four calories per gram? Is four, that how? Four calories per gram of protein. And so that's energy. That's mm. energy, yes. And that's the same for all protein. Well, well it's, it's. So, plant protein, animal protein would use I'm not the same. sure about plant protein. I don't yeah. know if Steve, Stephen knows, but it yeah. is four, mm. it's four calories per gram of protein and also amino acids. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amino acids are slightly higher. Yeah, per, so per this gram. This is weird. Yeah. Which amino acids? Well, phenylalanine has 6.7 um, calories per gram. Wow. Yeah. And how is phenylalanine used in the body as fuel? Because in my understanding, wouldn't if I was to supplement with phenylalanine as an amino acid, yeah. I'd be looking at manipulation of tyrosine and dopamine and, and noradrenaline and epinephrine, and, yeah, increasing endorphins and encephalins mm. and... Um, raising pain threshold, raising mood. But phenylalanine can go. When is it fuel? Phenylalanine can go in in quite a few different directions depending yeah. on what happens there, right? Because you need iron and biopterin as a cofactor to get that into uh, tryptophan. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but phenylalanine can also be uh, in the presence of gut dysbiosis can be converted to tryptamine. Um, so you got the wrong bugs. It'll totally hijack it and turn yeah. it into something else yeah. anyway. Yeah. And it inhibits, towards... it inhibits encephalase, which is an yeah. enzyme that breaks down the endorphins yeah, in the brain, so, so it changes your mood. When these people brain. are talking about calories, yeah. like you're saying, we're talking about putting some phenylalanine in a little yep. 
glass dish, yep. crucible, and putting it on a Bunsen burner, yep. and calculating the heat that's generated. And that's from exactly what it. that says: heat of combustion. Yeah, and that's a calorie. But that's got mm. nothing. I mean, when I take it in my body. Yeah. So if I'm adding this up and working out my calories, but then I take that in my body and it's used for moods and and um, pain and all that sort of stuff, and not used as a source. Of, when would it be used as a source of fuel if I'm bloody starving? Like, wouldn't it? I mean, if I took, so, no, I'm not, so if I was fasting for a period of time, I was low blood sugar and hungry, and then I took an essential amino acid blend that had phenylalanine in it prior to a workout, mm -hmm. in that instance, when the body's gone, man, you're trying to use fuel you don't have, in that instance, the phenylalanine may be more likely to be used as a source of fuel. Yeah, sure. through yeah. But still not all of it, huh? No. Yeah. It wouldn't be all of it. You're no. still gonna, it's still going to be so essential. Because, I mean, we need the phenylalanine as an essential amino acid for so many other yeah. functions. Unfortunately, calories have been used as a gold standard in nutrition. They're not no. because they're variable like that. A calorie is just a unit of energy yeah. when you burn it in a crucible. It doesn't happen in the human oh, body And like the that. good news, for, just for anyone out there that might be at this point in time getting offended to say oh. that, no, my life revolves around calories in, calories oh. out, and I have a system to calculate this, you're also right. We're not actually saying yeah. what you're doing is wrong. Mm. What we're doing is looking at the variabilities because what you'll do as a coach is you'll calculate using a system someone's required calories, yeah. give them a plan, and then if it's not working, you'll change it. Or yes. if they're getting – so you, you're doing the same thing. Mm. All we're trying to do is for those people that they get remarkable results, we can maybe explain how and why. Yeah. Um, for those people that get consistent results, we might be able to see why. For those people that are struggling to get results or for those – people that have got bizarre shit happening mm. we might be able to explain some of those things today so yep, but, but everyone's all cool and right mm. we're just trying to work out the gray area that's right yeah. well you know you, <laughs> you still you, you've got to consider calories as well but this was a, a, a very good paper um uh, published in scientific reports i think is uh, in nature sorry um and this one went into looking at the the uh, role of uh, the gut microbiome with something like a calorie restricted uh, diet oh yeah and mm. found if there was a very low Di uh, diversity in the bacteria in the gut, then it didn't matter, uh, irrespective of the caloric restriction, blood glucose and blood cholesterol levels increased. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess that's where the variability comes in, right? Mm. So you can restrict calories, yeah. but if you've got a, a, a variable such as poor gut microbiome diversity, it's probably not going to work as well for it's you. It's massively so, different. Mm. The mm. microbiome that you see in people is phenomenally different. Yeah, mm. like you can never see any two exactly the same. You never ever will, no. which is weird because if we're in the same environment, you'd expect it to be kind of similar. But then so many factors with that. So with yep. the protein, yep. so we've mentioned amino acids, they do have their calorific value. Yes. But to, it just does not make sense in no. that instance for me. We have a look at things like collagen. We had problems, um, not problems, but we just had to have different labels for different regions because in certain regions, because collagen is not a complete protein, meaning that it doesn't contain adequate levels of tryptophan and it's a little bit low in lysine and that sort of stuff to have complete protein, that they will not allow it to be called a protein food where thereby you can say it contributes to your daily protein requirements and therefore it doesn't even contribute to daily protein calories because they look at collagen as a structural protein um, and not a complete protein and not a source of fuel mm. because it's not capable of being your sole source of nutrition. Mm. Now, the things that I have problems with that is we know those in compounds within collagen have a calorie value. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not a marketing ploy to tell people the calories associated with it. Yeah. And I think what's happened in the past is they, they perceive that people are trying to substitute protein foods with alternatives and they want to shut that industry down or something and so they're saying you can't tell people that this is a protein yeah. you can't say that this is an alternative protein to you know meat or dairy or one of those other established industries i think or something i don't it's understand weird, it? it really but it's really quite confusing because the same thing with amino acids mm -hmm. you know and i understand it too because a few years ago there were some problems where people were substituting glycine for whey Yep. You know, 30% mm. of the product could be glycine, yep. significantly cheaper and nice and sweet and all yep. that sort of stuff. And they were trying to outlaw that industry. But then if we look at the fact that these amino acids still have a calorie value, it, yeah. it should still be labelled. I mean, the problem is that people should label honestly, regardless. Yeah, of course yeah. they should. Um, and But we shouldn't actually create laws that change the labelling for different region, regions in order to 
you know, clean up an industry. Exactly. You know, there have got to be other ways, which they can do now. They can test for ammonias and nitrogen retentions and water, all this sort of crap to see if it's pure mm. or not. But mm. uh, so, well, By, by the way, yeah, you mentioned gut microbiome and diversity yeah. before. It's called the Shannon Index, by the way. Oh, and 1,200 calories a day. <laughs> Not that, Shannon. <laughs> but we're getting it. It's called the, yeah, the, the, the diversity of the gut microbiome. <laughs> we, we'll get on to him. Is is called the Shannon index, and there's one sure way to increase the Shannon index mm-hmm. of your microbiome, and that's eating more protein. Yeah, creates more diversity. And this was this is a paper published on that um, just a couple of months ago, which is a great way to increase microbiome diversity. You would think, oh, it's fiber or it's something else. No, it's protein increases the Shannon index. Yeah, and it, and it supports like the growth of species such as your Bifidobacteria, yep. Lactobacillus, yep. Clostridia bacteria, and just, you know, Clostridia sometimes get a bad rap. There's a couple yep. of species that may be uh, pathogenic, but the thing is, oh, there's over a hundred species of Clostridia, and most of them predominantly are actually very beneficial yeah. to 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 prevent food uh, intolerances. Um, I never know how to pronounce this one. Escherichiae. Yeah. Just do it again. Is that how you do it? Escherichiae. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, no, cool. That's a good one. Cool. And, and then uh, Klebsiella as well is another that, one. Didn't you? Look how surprised you were. <laughs> I know. I was well, like, <gasps> not sure if this one's going to come in, out in right. In this paper, Acomanzia went up too. Yeah. Um, what with protein? Um, yeah, with protein. Yeah, nice. Uh, Bifidum bacteria did, and so did the Prevotella. Yeah. Wow. So that's oh, no, a good one. There's three species that in- increased. And yeah. th- this diet was a high-protein diet, but a, a calorie-restricted diet. So, so when you say high-protein, what yeah. are we talking about? Ah. Food. All right. You're talking about like meat, eggs. Meat, fish, eggs, uh, collagen. They're your, they're your complete proteins. Yeah. 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 yeah, so protein foods and that go in and have to be broken down, digested and all that sort of stuff. The highest high-protein diet I've yeah. seen in the literature is this one, which is a 4.4 yeah. grams per kilogram per day of protein, which is about, they say in the paper, about five times what you need. Yeah, right. And they did it on, they, they tried to get people to lose weight consuming loads and loads of protein. Yeah. And you want to know what happened? Did it work? Oh, oh. Worked very well. What happened? How much <laughs> they did lost they go weight. up to? They, well, they, they actually ended up consuming, they, they gave, this is interesting because most diet trials, they match the calories. Yeah, this one, yeah, they said, yeah. okay, we're going to match the food, but you guys have extra protein. So they gave guys extra protein through whey and meats yeah. and just extra protein. Yeah. And they, they got them up to 4.4, which is as much as they could possibly yeah. eat. They still lost more weight than the people having the moderate protein diet. Even though the fats and the carbs were exactly the exactly same. Exactly the same. They still lost a little bit more weight and so a little bit go, more fat. So they get so, so no change of carbs and fat. They sit Correct. there. They just allow them to ad libitum yep is that the ad word? libitum yep and then they just say eat protein foods yep. yep so if you want to eat anything else just eat protein and they had to you know what i love protein. about that and yep. what's freaky about that is yep. one of the biggest criticisms there's a lot of other papers that have been published over the years looking at satiety and all that yep. sort of stuff saying when they're allowing these people that the group that the other group that put on the weight ate more yeah and then so Surprise, well, surprise. Well, these guys, you know, like yeah. never, yeah. and then they'll just break it down. They go, it's still calories in, calories out. Those people did not, uh, they still ate more because they didn't have the satiety and then they put on the weight. But you're saying in this one, the group that ate the more calories yep. burnt more fat as long as it was protein. Correct. Well, they and only measured protein in this paper, hey? Well, no, they measured all the macronutrients, but mm. they gave them extra protein, yeah. 800 calories worth of extra protein per day. Yeah. And over, over for eight weeks, they gave them all this extra protein and they lost more body fat yeah. than the people that ate less. And they and didn't have to reduce the others. No. Nope. The only reason I say it, because I noticed there's a lot of papers where we can eat, go higher fat mm. yep, and we can burn fat. But in yep. those instances, they had to take the carbs out. Yeah, they didn't take and the then carbs there's, out. And yeah. then there's other studies yep. where we've gone higher in carbs and they've managed to lose yep. the weight, but, but they, they had to, to remove the fat. The fat yeah. yes. So what seems to be weird, so there's this interplay between carbs and fats yes. yeah. that protein doesn't seem to give a shit about. It doesn't. Well, it you think about it. breaks the rules. If you were, if you were like given a, a, a pot of sugar, right, mm-hmm. and said, yeah, you can eat as much uh, um, um, you know, sugar as you want, um, there'll be you'll you'll have a few teaspoons and you probably won't feel like sugar anymore. Yeah. If you give them a block of butter, which is pure fat, yeah. so you can eat as much butter as you want. Again, you know yeah. you, you won't get very far. Yeah. But you combine the two, uh, like a you know I'm going to use delicious a donut yes. as an example. <laughs> oh. That's that's where the satiety no, doesn't talking. kick in yeah. when we combine carbs and fats. Yeah, right. That's, that's it, there's a mechanism in the dopaminergic system yeah. in the brain, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's like you can't switch it off. But it's the same in our blood. Stream. Yeah. So within our bloodstream, so when we eat a diet that's high in fat, 
it actually helps to it, it so you get too much fat in your bloodstream you mm. can't burn the sugar the sugar mm. builds up so you mm. get you know insulin resistance and you get high blood sugar from too much fat in your bloodstream mm. if you have too much sugar then you actually end up with all of the extra f- body fat still in your bloodstream right. mm. so you got to like pick one or that it's yeah. like you got to in, well, they, if you they, imagine in your blood, you can only have sugar or fat yeah. at any one time, and then you're going to burn one of those. That's because they both, the, the, if you're from the macros, your protein is your repair and structure, mm-hmm. uh, although it can mm-hmm. be used for energy. But if we just simplify it, it's your fats and your carbs that's mm. the energy ones. Mm-hmm. And so your body will have to decide yeah. which one it wants to use. Yeah. And generally, our bodies are kind of more geared to be sugar burners than fat burners. Mm. What about so we'll, structural fats? I mean, we, we do have a lot yeah, of structural actually. fats. I mean, yeah, I've been, I brains. use a lot for, I have quite a bit for insulation and buoyancy purposes. <laughs> Structurally, I, I could live in the ocean. But, well, oh, man. It might, be, it might be easier, actually. Oh. <laughs> It'd be better on my knees. Well, <laughs> um, but so what was the hell was I talking about? I, got, I started to imagine structural myself fats. as a hippopotamus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so structural fats. I mean, what if we were to eat a lot more fats associated that, um, you know, like krills or... Um, things that are like um, yes. cell phospholipid mm. style mm. fats and mm-hmm. and those sort of things. Would they be more likely? Would we get less calories required? Some of those will be used into tissues. You know, like MCT. Yeah. Does MCT have any structural functions, or is it purely used as a source of fuel? There's My, an amazing thing about MCT you told me before. Yeah, Stephen, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I believe that uh, MCT is more. Uh, uh, it's 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 not really a structural. No, uh, it's just fuel. Lipid. Huh? It's just a fuel. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and the reason why is because. Uh, that's what makes it a little bit different to other fats is MCT which stands for medium chain triglycerides and that's just about how many carbons there are in in that fatty chain um, so it gets um, it gets absorbed and it goes through the portal system into the liver uh, where it's very rapidly oxidized and then used as a fuel it also doesn't need a certain transporter called um, uh, acyl, uh, acylcarnitine transferase to get into the mitochondria which is where a little furnace mm-hmm. where we burn energy mm-hmm. so it gets into the cells very quickly and all your body does is burn it for fuel it doesn't actually yeah. store it mm. your long chain triglycerides they actually bypass the liver uh, via the lymphatic system and they go straight to skeletal muscle and fat cells is that right yeah, so there's they add to that marbling and, and all that and that's exactly what it does so there huh. are differences in, in in fats for sure yeah, and, wow. and the mcts are fantastic because they're Which are the healthy fat the healthy fats. Well, they, they, they all are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I can't wait. Oh, no, I, I won't say anything. Wait till well, I see everything except stuff. for trans fats. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, good answer. Yeah. yeah, well done. See, you've got to remember that the medium chain triglycerides are saturated fats. Yeah, yeah. And they're very healthy for us. In fact, I cooked a brownie this morning or the other day. I don't know why I, I thought gave... of a shit then. As soon as you said, <laughs> I cooked a brownie this morning, I just imagined Steve laying a turn. No. <laughs> I didn't imagine well, at you least cooking some. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> she did. Did you bring it into work? I bring it into work. It had in nuts a, in, in it? it? It had nuts in it, didn't it? Corn? It if there's corn, corn in your brownie, you've got to be suspicious. <laughs> it, was, it was a little bit corn suspect. Corn carrot in a brownie. Nuts <laughs> very, like, very brown and it. moisty looking. <laughs> but at least my liked the taste uh, of it. <laughs> she ate the whole though. thing. Was it still steaming? <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> why do you keep looking at the time, Brooker? Um, now... <laughs> what were you talking about before you went? Crew? Oh, we're talking about MCTs. Oh, mate. yeah, you baked a brownie. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about your brownie. And it was rich in MCTs, <laughs> which are the saturated fats from hell, right? And that's the one that's really bad. Yet I eat it, I give it to my wife, and I gave some to Elizabeth. <laughs> so my brownie is super duper healthy. <laughs> and it does have little bits of nuts in it, though, so I don't know. That's it does a have little bits of nuts? Yeah. But the oil would make it. The oil makes it good. Come out good. It does make it come out out good. good. It comes out really good. Yeah. It's a really nice shape too and perfectly formed. What do you make your (laughs) – what shape are your brownies? Well, they're just a nice little sort of, you know, log shape things. They're they're great. Log shape Yeah, they are. And you chop them up to little bits so you can get them in your mouth easier. Yeah, it tastes great. Why is the Lisma crying? Plenty of fibre. <laughs> Plenty of fibre. That reminded me that Plenty we need of fi- to talk about fibre. <laughs> oh, phew. Get out the top. You want to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, fibre. Good, good place to put your fibre is in your brownies. Absolutely. There's plenty of fibre in my brownies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we mentioned protein. We've talked a fair bit about fats. Yes. We've somehow moved on to carbohydrates. <laughs> it includes fibrous brownies. Yes. 
They are beautiful. <laughs> and, and they're very high in fibre, very high in MCTs, and the combined thing fills you up. What? They fill you right up. <laughs> you don't feel like eating. As I said before, <laughs> I don't feel like eating right now. Fibre and fats fills you up. Oh, no, what that can does. You say? So, <laughs> what are you crying for, Alyssa? Yeah, what are you crying so, for? So, now, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, we've discussed a fair bit of what we're going to think of what we're talking about. But, oh, before we move on to this, okay, there was something else just before I move on to no, this with protein. So we talked a lot about the proteins. Yes, <sighs> and we so we mentioned amino acids apparently have a calorific value depending on the country, depending on mm -hmm. where you are, depending on the amino acids. Mm -hmm. It also depends on what state you're in when you take it and yep. i'm not referring to queensland or whatever um if you're in a calorie deficit state mm. and you're starving and you need fuel your body's more likely to use those and they're more likely to have some sort of calorific value mm -hmm. again i got a chance to say calorific um if those amino acids are combined into a peptide mm. Then those peptides will have a systemic function. Yep. And then they're broken down systemically by proteases where those amino acids mm. will have roles. But in, in, is a lot of the amino acids and peptides and protein conversion to fuel, does a lot of that occur via the liver and that first pass metabolism? Um, is that where it mainly Yeah, happens, it does. That's where you fuel, yeah. And you, you get what's called gluconeogenesis from proteins. Yeah. Such as alanine. And it, yeah. it can convert protein into sugar. So, all, so every amino acid, if you were to break them down, they got you can burn them and they'll yeah. release a thing. But in the body, they've got so many other functions. So many different So functions. hard to know where it would go. Yeah. You know, someone that's fully depleted their um, catecholamines and that sort of stuff through stress and they're using that phenylalanine mm. we're talking about with that higher calorie yield compared to the others. Yeah. It's more likely to be incorporated into making neurotransmitters for survival yeah. than it is just used as a source of fuel. Of course it would be. Yeah. Now then what about protease inhibitors and stuff? Because we looked wow. at, there's different protein rates of absorption. So we've got mm. slow protein and fast protein. Mm. The, the faster protein is the one that's got the reputation for the one that has the most muscle sparing effects to mm. be taken around training. Mm. And the slower proteins is more for regeneration, repair, structural stuff taken before bed. Is there anything in there, do you think? Is that real? That is real. I mean, the, the classic ones the body will use is casein and whey. Yeah. And casein is, is takes a longer time to yeah. digest. So yeah. in the olden days, you used to have, you know, a whack of casein at night before bed, so you'd remain anabolic all so night. So in that instance, is the protein, the calorie value of protein? Same. It's the same technically, but in the body, your fast and slow are going to work differently. Yeah. Very differently. Yeah, and also, you know, if we, if we go back to the gluconeogenesis, oh. even though it's not the ideal state you want to be in mm -hmm. continually, um, that process of gluconeogenesis and turning protein into sugar for fuel takes up a lot of calories. Yeah. You burn a lot of calories as opposed to eating a teaspoonful of sugar yeah. and, the, and the sugar getting into the bloodstream. Yeah, that's a really so, good point. So that's why, again, with that protein, that high level of protein definitely consumes a lot more calories just in that process of using it even if it is used as a source of fuel mm. it's nowhere near as efficient mm. and then the the thermic effects of fat um where do i find that it's none no bugger all it just slips straight in it the thermic effects of foods but then it has other effects that increase your metabolism later but yeah. we'll talk we can talk about them later if you want it spins me out eh? because we're looking at these things that they got these calorie yield when they burn them in a mm. in a container but in the body that the net calorie yield is significantly different Very and then different. to say that there's protein carb and fat yeah and that we've got a calorie yield from protein carb and fat and it's that's just the way it is yeah. that's like yeah. doesn't work. man that's dodgy i reckon yeah. and that Dodgies can't be help. possibly right no, well, because we've we just broken down tubes. protein yeah. alone even protein alone just point. yeah amino acids peptides protein then we'd look at an animal versus plant and then we've got to consider the things that are not actually the protein but are also found in, found in the same foods mm. so for example the plants mm. we look at it and saying yeah they might be nice for various reasons mm -hmm. and stuff like that but they some of them have got protease inhibitors yes and, you know soys and that sort of stuff in particular significantly you might be adding these things in to increase your protein mm -hmm. content and the calories from your protein but they actually don't absorb those proteins so you've just tricked yourself 
Absolutely. And the other thing is you could be absorbing a lot of amino acid with leucine, for example, mm. which increases mTOR, the mammalian target of rhabdomycin complex one, which increases growth in your yeah. body. So therefore, it would stimulate your other proteins to be incorporated into the muscle tissue yeah, and not yeah. burn as calories. Yeah. So, you know, plus there's that thermic effect of digestion because protein does sit in your stomach, take long digest, there's more stomach acids. Yeah. Energy is yeah. required to burn it. And also, if you look at the structure of proteins, amino acids, the amines and the acid group, they look nothing like fat. So to get them all the way through to fat yeah. is a massive process of gluconeogenesis. Yeah, right. And then the glucose has to be turned into fat. Yeah. And it's yeah. a pain in the ass. That's why you can eat a lot of it without putting on weight. Yeah, yeah. the body would find it easier to incorporate it into some other structural tissue. And, and, fat, and as, you, as you guys are both practitioners, you know, I did a little bit of it. But it's very difficult to say to someone, OK, I want you to lose weight, just eat less. It doesn't seem to work. It never yeah. did for me. Just say, oh, no, you're overweight. Just eat less, whatever it is. Now there's a way of saying, well, we can cheat that a bit. You can fill up on proteins a bit yeah. and not worry so much yeah. about putting but on how long? I always worry about the adaptation. I mean, yeah. is that a short-term thing? Like what well, sort of time frame have the studies been? Eight weeks was the study where they gave them loads oh. of protein. And that's that, a decent time. Mm, and they still lost two months. That. Yeah. Now their, their, their weight didn't drop as much as the other guys, but their fat dropped more. Oh, it's because their muscle... Correct. Yeah, right. And not everyone I know Maybe wants some to... uric acid and yep. that is with me a bit of water. Yeah. Because I know if I eat too much protein, I get a bit uric acidy gouty. Yeah. And it holds all that extra water onto me yep. as well. And then you just strip that out with you know the celery seeds or whatever and all yeah. of a sudden you've dropped so, five kilos in a week and if it's so, you're so, so you know, committed and, and, to your diet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, this this sort of cutting on calories is is you know, makes sense. And you will. If you eat less calories, you'll mm. lose weight. There's no question about that. But People find that difficult to follow, most people, let's yeah. face it. It's just difficult. Yeah. So, you know, in 72 when the Atkins revolution came out where he said, no, eat unlimited proteins and unlimited fats. Just cut this one macronutrient, carbohydrate, yeah. down to 50 grams a day and you're sweet. And since then, studies have confirmed that that, that actually process with the unlimited fats and proteins seems to work for people. It certainly improves their body composition. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, and it does now. The, yeah, well, no, yeah, it makes sense that we've got this protein doesn't follow the rules. Yeah. And it looks like the carb and the fat is the real thing to mm. to mm. play around with, hey? Yeah. Um, so with we mentioned protein labelling laws and all that sort of oh, shit. Yeah. Man, I used to spend a lot of time in my naturopath clinic looking at labels and trying to show people the carbohydrates, total carbohydrates, fibre, mm. sugar. Who wants to pick on that? Who wants to explain well, I can, that shit? I can Do start it. a little bit there. <clears throat> you can use this as an example if you wanted to. Yeah. So looking at the label. All right, so because this is the thing that, you know, a lot of people don't don't kind of get when they go to shopping. Because you want to kind of like, when you, when you want to, when you're purchasing carbohydrates, you try to aim for the low glycemic index carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And so carbs is made up of, you know, fiber and sugar and, you know, um, more non-digestible uh, carbohydrates as well. And so what I tell people is what you do is whenever you look at a label, and if we, we've got the uh, lovely No Way ice cream here, this is the minty chocolate flavor, um, and the label here says carbohydrate, and you, I always say go per hundred, look at the per hundred gram. Percentage. So carbohydrate, because that gives you a percentage, mm -hmm. is 4.3 grams per hundred gram in a year. So it's 4.3%, awesome. very, very low. Mm. Um, then if we look at the sugars, uh, only 2.8 grams per 100 grams, so that's only 2.8% um, sugars. Uh, th this will, you know, this is a very well balanced kind of, um, in terms of the it's sugar and the carbohydrate. We so <laughs> well, we, I mean, we, that's not like a. We no. should have brought wheat bix or something in. Oh, that's so we terrible. Can show the difference well, between sugar it, and If you take a bag of sugar, yeah. a bag of sugar is 100 grams per 100 grams carbohydrate, and of that carbohydrate, 100 grams is sugar. Yes, yeah. That's what it is, and that's how the the whole glycemic index was kind of formulated. Oh, so if you want really? To, so it's just on glucose. It's based on, and fiber. Yeah, it's based on sugar. Yeah. So if you want to kind of know if something is low glycemic index, you kind of like take the total carbohydrate mm -hmm. uh, and um, divide well you just can kind of subtract the uh, sugar content or you look at how much of percentage the sugar makes up of that total carbohydrate content mm -hmm. if it's 50 percent or higher you know you start uh, wondering about you know uh, how healthy it so could we got be total carbs is going to be broken up between sugar and fiber, fiber mm. and then there, there will be like a total a carbohydrate leftover bit. yeah yeah, yeah that complex carbohydrates. The complex yeah. carbs. That they don't have a category for that, really. No, it's just it's so the no. added. And now, when they say sugars, that category on the nutrition panel, that's specifically for added sugars, or does that 
Total sugars. No, no, that's, that's for total, total, <coughs> that's for the sugars you, you within it. the carbohydrates. So what's a sugars? So we're talking about sucrose, fructose, yeah. glucose, lactose. Yes. And yeah. Glucose, lactose and is a sugar. Dextrose. Yeah. And those sort of things. Maltose. So they add up to the. So they're the simple sugars. Yep. Yeah. The rest of it's starchy. Yeah. Carbs. Yep. And then we've also got the fibre. And yep. the difference with fibre is the fibre does not get broken down and absorbed directly as glucose. That's right. It, well, it's, glucose it's used is. as either. Um, get your shit together. Yep. Yeah. Um, fiber for your poops. And, and interestingly, um, or for the microbiome to feed them yeah. to look after the health of your gut wall. Yeah. Because I mean, it'd be very stupid to take nutrients out of your bloodstream for your gut wall, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's got to go past the gut wall to your blood and then back again. Yeah. So the microbes that cover that right where all the food is, it's like, mm. look, we'll just take it here and then that's you guys right. can have the leftovers. Yeah. And that's interesting because the um, the total amount of carbohydrates, absorbable carbohydrates mm. in, as you mentioned before, wheat because is sixty nine percent. Oh, so absorbable carbohydrates. 69%. 69% instead which of like 2% yeah. or something. Yeah, which and is just, horrendous. I just Holy hell. Especially if you have a whole bowl of it. Hang on, so yeah. what is it? So you, 69%. 69% of yeah. your wheat bit thing is absorbable sugar. Yeah, it turns like, into sugar. Ultimately, it yeah. would be no different to being having 69% of the weight of that box as just sugar. Yeah, because it turns yeah. into just sugar. Like cane sugar. It's going to do the same thing to your body. Actually, worse, glucose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so, and this is where, this is where then, the trap is. And then, so that is. leaves the rest as fibre? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a small amount of fibre. And... Yeah, there's a small amount of fibre and protein because uh, it's, it's... But we've got to remember, wheat bix is a very refined product. How much? Um, do you remember how much? No, I don't. I just remember the 69 for some reason. The fibre, you mean? <laughs> Dodgy bastard. So, um, the, um, so the fibre then would be what, 20 or No, no, it's less than that. It's, 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 I think it's less than 10% fibre. Oh, you got to remember Whit Bix is highly refined. Yeah, because you know this ice cream. Well, that's got about 6.8 well, This is ice cream, yeah. So we're like 8.5% fibre. Oh, 8.5. Yeah, 8.5% yeah, 8. fibre. And it's a good soluble fibre too. And it's, yeah, it's excellent. So Grains have usually And then we've got the... So the carbohydrate, we've got 4.3 total, but only 2.8 of that is sugars. Yeah. And then, and the funny thing is, is a lot of those sugars actually come from the cultured dextrose, which is a preservative, <laughs> preservative. system. It's like a, yeah. a mod biotic yep. uh, compound where we've got the, the bugs living inside the sugar so no other bugs can live there. We've already filled it up with dead bugs. It's like yogurt, you know. And then how much protein? About, about 11%? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? So, right. And then depending also on the... Why is it bad? Oh, sorry, 14%. Oi! Yeah, so... So, Matt, how many stars does your new um, breakfast have out of five? Five star. Five out of five. Five star health rating ice cream. So, so as far from a macro point of view... It's Better you than wheat bix. But anyway, what are we talking about? Fiverr. So, when we have <laughs> the fiver <laughs> That was full. Was it? No, <laughs> no, just fucking with you. Um, so... So what we're looking at is we've got to break it down and the fibre's not absorbed. Who knows what the fuck is insoluble and soluble? Is it that it does dissolve in your glass of water or not? <laughs> Do you want me to tell you or not? Tell us. Come on, right. bring it. It's a loaded question, but not a rhetorical yeah. question. Solubilizes soluble in water and also feeds the bacteria in the gut. Insoluble fibre goes through unchanged. Oh, so, yep. for example, you can break soluble fibre down into saturated fats like butyric acid, acetic mm -hmm. acid, and propionic acid, which mm -hmm. feed the colonocytes, actually. Yeah, yeah, right. Console. So it's a beneficial. So way. those fuels. So those fuels. So you're yeah. basically saying fiber via our microbiome is converted to fuel. Yes, for our colonocytes. Our gut wall. Our gut wall. Mm. Sorry, yeah. And it also gets into our liver and that sort of stuff as well. Yeah. But yeah, we don't. It's gastro. not a calories for us. No, we, not really. Is it like a ketone? Though? No, ketones are a slightly different formula. Um, these are saturated fats, so they've got no double yeah. carbons in it. A ketone has a double bond attached to an oxygen is that, there much calories chemical. that come out of a ketone do you yeah. know the calorie yeah. yield from a ketone yeah i what think it's it? about five or six yeah wow per ketone yeah hey man so what's the calorie yield from fat nine so doesn't when you break down fat doesn't it convert to ketones yep does it get like a double hit yeah, it like well, a turbo? It's like protein. Turbo charge, we're going to take that back and pump yep, it back exactly. into the Exactly, it's, it's like low protein, breaks down to amino acids, and then they have a calorific value too. So is it fat in more than nine? No. If well, it's fat plus ketones, well, I mean... It, mostly you don't produce enough ketones to worry about because you need to produce ketones in the absence of carbohydrates. Uh, yeah, so if in mm, a calorie deficit yeah. with that higher fat, you'll make yeah. the ketones. Or you've got type 1 diabetes. And you urinate. And, and most of the urinate? I just urinate. That's a metal from your... Uranium. Um, <laughs> Uranus? Yeah. Probably Uranus, you mean? Uranus yes. is where we find uranite. Yeah. Um, 
<coughs> fuck am I talking about now? <laughs> talking about ketones. Oh, good. Uh, we do We add a lot of them and breathe them out anyway. We do. So they're not necessarily always used for fuel. Exactly, so and you, you can measure them in the urine. But if you're starving and you've got no carbs, the body will use them as fuel. And our it's brain loves them as brain fuel. loves them. Yeah. yeah, they're nice, clean, consistent energy source. So what's crazy about that then? So we've mentioned the sugar and the mm. fats and everything like that. So we know that sugar's got a calorie. And this is what screws with me. This is the macro mysteries that mm. really bugs with me. Because if I get – we know that the sugars and the fibres have a calorie value. I know that MCTs and fats also have a calorie value. Mm. So if I eat both of them together, I should be able to combine those calories and add them onto my calorie intake. Yeah. But what messes with my head is cooking is chemistry mm. and alchemy and all that sort of amazing stuff. And so what actually happens is if you cook those things together first, you can actually make something else like resistant starch, which you don't absorb. Correct. That yeah. studies where they did, they found that you get less calories from oily, greasy, old fried rice mm. compared to the same amount of freshly steamed, beautiful rice, basmati rice or something. What spun me out about that is, and it's just the process of it, yep. you cook this rice and you would eat that and it tastes like pretty much nothing. There's nothing there. It's just yep. this rice, this beautiful, freshly light steamed rice. It's clean, it's nice, it's everything about it. it's great. Yep. Now, if I do something different with that rice by putting oil on the water first and then absorbing that oil, so that extra oil, extra calories yep. I add to the rice, if that absorbs into the rice and then I let it sit and get old and then I cook it again, yeah. the oil and the sugar, the amylos and amylopectins or whatever, they, those things combine with the oil and make a wax. Yes. And that wax is a what we call a resistant starch, yep. which we don't absorb and it feeds our gut bugs instead. If I was to be counting calories, you know, using an app going, okay, so I've added my rice, I've yep. added my oil, mm. and I've added a bit mm. of egg, and I'm going to make it into this wicked stir fry. Yep. It's basically doubled your calories as you're making that recipe, of I'm course, sure. Yeah. Mm. But then when you actually eat it, you get less out of it. Yeah. This is the sort of stuff that makes me go, why am I counting stuff? <laughs> do, you, do you want me you to know? give you some, some figures from 2013 where they tested this? Yeah, why this? not? All right. They start off with rice at 0.7 resistant starch, right? So three-fifths of bugger all. When you do the process you did, you end up with 15.8% resistant starch. Bloody hell. What was the first number? 0.7. I've got a terrible memory. So you, you increase it by 20 times the resistance starch. Bloody hell. So... Yes, the calories are still there. If you burn them in the crucible, they'll still burn. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the same with these alkalizing and alkaline and acid and everything. <laughs> they just put it in a crucible and put litmus paper in. Yep. Yeah. After they burnt it. After they burnt it. They burn it. Yeah. And they go, oh, let's do another experiment. We've got a whole heap of this ash. And they add a little bit of water into it and make it a black goo and then put litmus paper in and go, oh, oh that's, that's alkaline. Because they don't understand buffer systems in the body. Yeah. Well, they don't understand... They, the fact is, that remember that there was one paper, I wish I thought about this earlier, but there was that one paper where they compared that meat eating vegetables, so fish and vegetables and red meat and vegetables and everything and vegan and everything. And mm. the vegan diet was the most acidic. Yeah, probably. And they come back and said they didn't have the required proteins to manage such the things as uric acid. Yeah. It was weird mm. because it was actually the uric acid which was the highest and the vegans, and which was not... What you'd expect, because we're all told uric acid comes from eating yeah. too much meat and alcohol. But we know now you know? that it's carbs. It's uric Sugar acid. Sugar puts it up faster than mm. anything and by if, your liver. And if you eat an apple um, um, and you the, the soluble fibre breaks down in your gut, it forms acids. Yeah. But, so it's not acid, it's not alkaline forming. It forms oh, we do acid, acid alkaline. I no, have just a, opened yeah. another massive can of worm. That's yeah, another that's, crucible versus human body. We need to do a podcast series. We are not a crucible. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> we are not. Uh, we're not test tubes. Yeah. Yeah. Know? yeah. So. And it's incredible because also then you got to take into individuality. We can like, do in vivo Las Vegas. In vivo yeah. Las Vegas. <laughs> Oh, it is. oh my gosh! It's so different, um, and and the whole acid alkaline and the whole crucible thing is, you know, when I talk about calories, I talk about it as a unit of energy because I'm a chemist tra first. Yeah. And then we talk about it in the body, and it's totally different. It's crazy, yeah. It's it's crazy. I mean, you can burn wood, and it produces calories, right? Because yeah. But you eat it, and you won't digest it; it'll come out. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so it's got calories, but you won't absorb it. 
So, so there's different calories. And then, of course, you mentioned fats before, the highest calories. Fats also increase the metabolism in the body via another process called uncoupling protein, where it causes protons to leak right. inside the cell. So the body goes, shit, protons. And it's got to get energy, ATP, to pump them yeah. back out again. Yeah. So it uncouples the protein, causes the protons to leak into the cell, and then energy is required to pump them out. So you actually burn <laughs> the fat you eat, which is why high-fat diets don't seem to have a negative effect on weight gain when they, when they go through all these studies. Bloody like hell. Like the Atkins diet. It's like, as long as the work? carbs aren't there. The carbs are here. Yeah, so, but if that's the sugar's yeah. there, yeah. Yeah. then it's all it's, bad news, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, then you get news. the advanced glycation end products and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just the oxidized sugar. It's like burnt sugar. Yeah. It's a crust. Which then damages <laughs> proteins yeah. and... And damages yeah. everything, receptors. So so this whole thing... And of course, here's another mind thing for you. If you want Because you're talking about fatty acid oxidation, a lot of oxidative processes. So you have all that sugar there, yeah. just all oxidizing and burning, huh? Yeah. And it damages whatever it's attached to. It just... Just yeah. like when you put sugar on the outside of the meat. Yeah, car- that caramelization. Yeah, that's what we're yeah. talking about inside your body. Yeah, it's, it's happening. caramelizing your blood vessels. Oh, that's crazy, eh? And Brooklyn, you remember the reaction that's called? The Millard reaction. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that, Brooke? Eh? <laughs> Brooklyn would know that. Um, you answered that. You should have let her answer it first. You just pretty much... Well, she had her head down. I thought she was napping, actually. She probably was. <laughs> Taking oh, right. notes about Steve-O's inappropriateness. <laughs> probably. What's alcohol, then? Oh, wow, that's interesting. It is. It, is. it makes me... F- I yeah. love it. The alcohol yeah. that you drink is called ethanol, so let's get... And it's got a fairly high calorific yeah. value of about 7 or 8. Yeah. It's My high brain just straight away goes, yeah. what, do you have alcohol you don't drink? But, but what, what, you <laughs> what, what no, if no, I no, give no. you a, another alcohol that's not called ethanol, but it's called something like glycerol? Oh, yeah. yeah. Still an alcohol. Yeah, yeah. You don't absorb it very well. Yeah, right. Erythritol. Yeah. Alcohol. Yeah. Doesn't get absorbed. So it's to go with glycerol and glycerins and things like Calories that. Calories are the same as ethanol. Yeah. But the absorption is completely different. Oh my god. So all bets are off. It is. Uh, yeah. And, and and if you look at alcohol, which like mm. Steve said, is ethanol. First step of ethanol metabolism is the alcohol dehydrogenase gene mm. uh, or enzyme, uh, and that then converts um, al- uh, ethanol into acid aldehyde, which gives you the um, the hangover symptoms. And then acid aldehyde is broken down through um, al- uh, acid aldehyde dehydrogenase two into acetate yes. and acetate uh, can then have a, a, it directly inhibits fatty acid oxidation yeah, wow. so when you consume alcohol that if, if you look you know we talked about macros such as fats and carbs being being the fuel sources or the energy sources well alcohol is the preferred fuel sources even from fat and from carbohydrates so when you have alcohol that's what your body will be uh, metabolizing yeah. and using as a fuel source which is why you get drunk so quickly you know um uh, by drinking and your body will park the carbs and the fat and say well no i've got i've got plenty of fuel here thank you very much yeah. and so apart from the acetate produced through alcohol metabolism that inhibits fatty acid oxidation it also slows down many other processes like thyroid which is also involved in metabolic rate yeah. uh, and it stops your body from burning uh, carbohydrates yeah, and it's fat com- it's a comp- it's a competitive fuel source that's right so, so what a bad thing yeah, but and it doesn't act like it. So a lot of these people, because it doesn't fit in as a protein, carb or fat, a lot yeah. of people just totally dodge it. And yeah. then the same with, again, back to the labeling laws, a lot of those other things like your erythritols, your maltitols, your xylitols, they're not a protein, carb or fat. No. There's yeah. no place for them on the nutrition panel. No. And if they're not on the nutrition panel there, they don't contribute to the calories because the calories in the macros have got to add up at the top. So a lot of these things have a calorific value or something like that but they're not actually calculated properly no but they they also have like a you know the things like the erythritol and the xylitol and the mannitol Mm. and all your other types of sugars Mm. they absorb slightly differently in the Mm. gut as well right so there's a a, a table here in this uh, research paper that was published in the department well this was just done by the department of molecular virology and microbiology and they had a a table here to show like the percentage of different types of sugars and where they absorb. So things like your sucrose, your glucose, your fructose, all those general sugars, uh, 95 plus percent gets absorbed in the small intestine. Yep. Um, so that will obviously, um, you know, increase your blood sugar levels, your blood glucose levels. And then when we look at things like uh, erythritol, so erythritol my eyes, I have to look at this very slowly. So erythritol actually... <laughs> <laughs> Or just very don't track. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to move the paper that way? Yeah, we'll just move so it. I mean, very closely. 
So erythritol was actually 90 percent of erythritol was absorbed in the small intestine. Uh, xylitol only fifty percent is yeah, absorbed right. in the small intestine, and mannitol only twenty five percent. Yeah, wow. So what even about those maltitol is that in that as well? Maltitol. Yeah. Man, no, they didn't just, do maltitol. Oh, I'm just thinking 100 large intestine, guaranteed. <laughs> I tell you which that one, one was. That one, and I'll be halfway through a block of. Fake well, sucro- sucralose yeah. was the one that's in the large intestine. Yeah, so ninety percent right. of sucralose so it bypasses the small intestine, yeah. and it goes to the large intestine. Wow! Um, but sucralose, like Steve pointed out earlier, it messes up your gut microbiome. Yeah. So even yeah. though it doesn't get absorbed in the small intestine, so it doesn't raise your blood glucose levels. Yeah. It's, it, and this it, that also too, you know, we do a lot of those. Um, um, specific carb diet when these people get a real bad overgrowth in the large intestine of microbes that's why we go for the real simple sugars when we're trying to starve the bugs and people go but I'm eating sugar it's going to be really bad for my gut bugs mm. it's like only if they're in the small intestine as you see yes. most of them are absorbed before the large intestine real sugars yeah. and that's how when we do those um, killing sprees to try to fix the dysbiosis and the overgrowth in the large intestine then we use the simpler sugars so that you can still basically have your sugar um mm. and we can not feed the bugs but still feed you amazing you know? isn't and it? that's why the funny thing is these people that um have these problems in their large intestine and they go into the medical world and say just eat like a bland diet just eat like basic food and say advice like that which i don't understand but that most people then will interpret that into rices and breads and yeah. you know like bland colorless yeah um, white foods white white complex carbs yeah and they go for all those complexy carbsy sort of bickies and all that sort of stuff and rices and that where and then they go back and all of a sudden they just go stupid and eat give up and just go and lollies and shit and their guts come good mm. And they're just like, what the heck? I can live on lollies and not have a gut problem, but the moment I put in a complex carb or a nice boiled steamed rice or something like that, my gut's a crook. And you got to remember, that. That complex carbs are not complex for the body to break down. It's easy for the body to break down. Oh, really? Very easy. If you have rice, you'll, you'll digest it and disappear real It's quickly. just that it's a large molecule. Like, so they're just yeah. chipping away. It's yeah. got to go from the outside in, yeah. and each one of those, it's like a snowball-y, yeah. three-dimensional fluff ball thing and it's got a they just got to keep chipping away on the outside Absolutely. things like maltodextrin is a technically a complex carb absorbed at the same rate as a simple sugar, sugar yeah. because yeah. it's a long single chain yeah. Yeah. so they've just got to hack it off at the end as opposed to attacking this ball of this surface ball. area you know so amazing isn't it it and is there's so many sort of contradictions in nutrition. One, one I want to throw to, to you guys arachidonic acid oh man mm. we're going back to fats a little bit so arachidonic acid is the reason why naturopaths always told people to avoid red meats because it's mm. going to contribute to your arthritis and your yeah. heart disease and everything bad in the world comes from this arachidonic acid. And that was probably another test tube moment, wasn't it? It was another test because, tube moment. No, literally, like we used to take the arachidonic not we specifically, but the scientific community, yeah. for example, would add arachidonic acid onto a mouse's ear yeah. to make it swell up mm. to... In- induce inflammation yep. so they could test their anti-inflammatory compounds yep, exactly on it. yeah and those so but then in the human body so then the assumption was that the more arachidonic acid found in meat the more we're going to die yeah um but then they started testing it was actually william llewellyn was the guy that yep. really behind this amazing guy because if, if you can imagine going against the whole world saying this stuff is bad yeah and you having a theory that no nah, i think it's good and then just going through the process, the, the highlight for this guy's career would have had to have been the moment when all of his haters and the guys that were trying to prove arachidonic acid is going to cause heart disease, that this is this evil stuff that's going to kill everyone, um, actually came back and said, well, when we tried to prove that theory, it actually was the opposite. Yeah. They were the ones that said that showed that arachidonic acid can have an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant effect. It can enhance muscle growth and it can support all of those processes exactly. rather than have them all destroyed. And I've got a great paper that, that was is written by... Is it William Lewell? No, it's, it's from Bill Campbell and Richard Kreider. Oh, there you go. They were yeah, two of the mates. authors of the paper. I know, I know, absolutely. Mm. And what they did was they gave them arachidonic acid, supplemented with after 50 days, the inflammatory cytokine in ligand 6 was significantly lower um, with the supplemental arachidonic acid group. Crazy, hey? There you go. Now, oh, now that's it. just like mind... Because, you know, arachidonic acid was the work of Satan mm. um, and it was inflammatory and all this sort of <coughs> stuff. And now we know that it's anti-inflammatory and it also builds your muscles. And in the Incredible. bodybuilding community, um, a lot of bodybuilders 
typically at the diets and that sort of stuff that they have, they avoid a lot of cereals and grains. Mm. Um, they typically have a very high omega-3 and a low omega-6 diet. Mm. Um, they're eating a lot more of those meats. They are, and these days, there's a lot more grass-fed stuff. And people mm. are actively going out looking for these things. I used to test the lipid profiles in a lot of athletes, hey, and their omega-6 was deficient. And what was interesting, it was, it was yeah, Compared to the rest of the population, it was the exact opposite. But these guys were committed to eating these certain foods, chicken, broccoli, pretty much every yeah, three yeah. hours. Chicken, <laughs> yeah. that's right, chicken. But they had none of those other grains and cereals, mm. so their omega-6s were significantly lower. Mm. Um, and one interesting feature with them and with the arachidonic acid supplementation is if they had actually got to a point where training consistently, to often enhanced athletes with a higher omega-3, lower omega-6, they had no soreness. Mm. They trained. They were not getting sore at all. And then you move in the put in the arachidonic acid. <clears throat> and they feel like it's their first day back at the gym. Mm. All of wow. a sudden, the soreness they're getting in the muscles, and then all of a sudden, it just gives them that that plateau. They've also done studies on um, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, uh, COX two inhibitors that actually shown to block arachidonic acid induced mm. inflammation, and they could stop a lot of muscle hypertrophy yes. by actually cancelling out the signals that need to be recovered. And, and these are common, you know, neurofrenzy yeah. inhibitor. Yeah. Um, floxacam is a is a really potent one that yeah. lasts for 24 hours in the body once you take it. These are real common things that people take to for headaches or for pain or for anything. And, they, you know, even Celebrex, another one. Um, Vioxx was another one until it got banned. And the, um, <laughs> hey, another thing that screws me just quickly, I know we're running out of time, but this is something that has bugged me. And I was just l looking at your glass of water and you were talking about that water, yes. you know, crucible crap before yep. with the calories and everything like that. Negative calorie food. <gasps> So remember, I remember there was that thing that was going, oh, you can pretty much just eat celery. And, and you cucumber were... was the other the, the, one. And so I think that... zucchini may have yeah, been. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I got yeah. celery. So I'll tell you something interesting. So the ones that were looked at as negative calorie foods were celery, which is typically 14 calories per cup. Yep. Carrots is 52 calories, which surprised me because it's so yeah. high in sugar. Mm. Um, lettuce is five. Broccoli, 31. Grapefruit, 69. Tomato, 32. These are all per cup. Cucumbers, eight calories per cup, 46 for watermelon, apples, and a lot of these are sugary, bloody things as well. Mm. i tell you what's interesting about it, though. It was the water. When you were talking about the water, I was just curious because those foods are really high in water. Like yeah. um, mm. they got 95% water in celery, 94% um, cucumbers are 95% water. Is the, the, the thermic effects of those foods, the, the energy required to chew them, mm and digest them and break them down is it cancels out. I don't believe it could be a food if it's negative calorie. It wouldn't be a food if it's going to actually take more. If it's not going to contribute energy, it's going to just destroy you if you ate it. I don't well, think... Well, if that's all you ate, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think... Yeah, so these the, things... The are, I, think, I think a very low calorie yield, maybe. Yeah. I, I don't think they're going to be negative yeah. calorie yield. I think that'd yeah. be very weird. I think your body would just go, look, just shit it out. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to bother breaking this down for a negative calorie. <laughs> you know, this it doesn't glass, make sense. This glass of water will be negative calories because the temperature is at 20... Two degrees, mm. and I've got to raise that to 37 in my body. Mm. That requires energy, and it's got no calories. So a lot of these really high water things yeah. are the things that have those really low calories. Is that? Do you think is it, it's the heating yeah. of the water? Oh, but I um, want to ask you a question about that, Steve. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm curious now. So we're talking about <laughs> heating water up, right? Yeah. So what if you drink a cup of tea, yeah. which is hot, yes. way hotter than our body temperature? Yeah. Yeah. What What happens there? Is there any kind of do you burn calories cooling the water down? No, but you disperse calories by cooling the water. Yeah, down. but there's big links with the nitric oxide. <clears throat> And metabolism as well too. So mm, maybe yes. in those hot, dr hot drinks, we need to release those heat, and that will then Absolutely. do some bloody thing. Look, I mean, um, if you drink cold coffee. drink. So oh, what about the other? Again, with associations, they did those meta analysis. I just oh, yeah. always be careful about a meta analysis. They did a meta analysis just trying to look at patterns between fat people, skinny people, and what they went and said: "Gee, skinny people eat a lot, like six meals a day." And you know, so you know, fat people should do that too, and you'll also become skinny. Oh. So what you're looking at is association's dangerous. If you go and tell a fat person to go and eat six meals a day, yeah, that's not necessarily going to do anything because the studies are actually showing that you get more thermic effects out of your bigger meals. 
you're better off with larger meals yes um because you get more um you get it's it's less efficient (laughs) yeah you get more um, calorie burn and less calorie yield with a larger meal than six smaller meals and you had is that the data on satiety two two, two papers here um on that particular topic so uh physically the the big question is should you eat like let's say you have to eat two thousand calories in a day do you have it over three meals or six meals What's the typical thought out there, do you think? People typically, I think, would say eat more, less oh, meals. Oh, we're all more. told to eat more often. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least it was very Every popular about hours. 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they tested that in a study, of course, and they found that we conclude that increasing meal frequency from three to six meals has no significant effect on 24-hour fat oxidation but may increase hunger and desire to eat. Mm. It just keeps that stomach cranking, hey? Well, yeah, but let, let, let's say you have breakfast and it's a half breakfast because yeah. you've got to eat less calories. You're going to feel, oh, I'm still a bit hungry. Yeah, and, and, so and you... the calorie yield is going to be more efficient. Yes. Because you're going to have lower calories. Your body's going to yeah. take those calories out. It's not going to burn as yep. much calories in the process. So less meals, but bigger meals for fat loss seems better. But for it muscle is. gain... Yeah, for oh. muscle gain, the guys that want to put on weight, yeah. they mm. need to be eating every three hours. Absolutely, yeah. and that's what the, the pros do. They they get up first thing before they it's train. The only way to get the all they do is they eat and train yeah. and sleep. Yeah, yeah. And this this other study on on meal frequency and metabolic profiles, e, uh, the less you eat, the less times you eat, the more resting metabolic rate you have. And also, if you constantly no, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it does if you, but. If, if you constantly divert energy just towards digestion, mm. uh, you know it's not going to go to um, other important areas such yeah. as the brain and yeah. yeah, you know. So we want to be efficient in digestion, and during those phases of digestion, you want to stop doing what you're doing and mm. focus. I mean, there's a lot of data. I, I looked up for a heap of data regarding chewing and ways of burning calories and increasing the effects of food. And there's studies out there showing that oh, if you eat standing up and if you eat walking and all that sort of stuff. It's, I tell you, it's funny. I, was, I had Alfie here with me today, and I was reading this paper this morning, and it was talking about um, um, seated walking um, <laughs> versus standard walking, uh, standing walking. Seated and I walking. said to Alfie, I said, "What do you reckon seated walking would be? Like compared? a little pedal under yeah. the desk? Yeah, really." And, and Alfie said, "Oh, so you know what happens when you sit down for a while? Sometimes yeah. when you stand up, the chair just gets stuck to you." So when the chair stuck to you, when you're walking away with the chair stuck to you, <laughs> that's seated walking. Standard and walking is when you just get up out of your chair and walk. Wow. It's He's just, doing the perfect demonstration too with a uh, chair on his back. So, 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 what, so, so what do we do? The, the average Joe Sixpack comes in to see you guys. I don't know. That's what I, I just wanted to mess shit up. They, they want to lose weight. What do we do? You, you told don't know. Brilliant. I don't know. You, you Actually, just you start. Doing? I don't yeah. know what I said. <laughs> Two days ago, you, you gave me a great. You say, look, basically they can eat unlimited protein and fats and just have these carbohydrates. And yeah, yeah well, it's, but it's it's not even like that. Everyone mm. is so different. Yeah. I don't think there is one thing that we can say to everyone. Everyone's got a different microbiome. Everyone's got different genetics and different profile, different lifestyle, mm. different environment, different temperature, exposure. Yep. You know, there's so many variabilities. I think the key is is to just. Drop the ego and the arrogance. No one knows everything. Mm. Go from a decent starting point. But don't treat mm. fat and don't treat diseases. You treat people. You just yeah. go through. When someone says, I'm doing this sort of stuff to their coach, as a coach, don't go, that's bullshit because I don't believe you because when I do that, I see something different mm. or something. You know, just assume mm. that people are being honest and they're all working towards the same goal with you. Yeah. And then a lot of it's variable. A lot of it's just asking these questions. And then the funny thing is, is so these some of these coaches may be so consistent with the way they prepare their meals. Mm. So, so some of these people might actually be the meal prep that they're doing, creating resistant starch. That might yeah. be the difference for the coach compared to someone that's eating – making fresh meals every day yeah. and might be changing the grains because they're still experimenting with recipes and stuff. So it's like drop the ego and just there is no shortcuts. There is no simple way. It's just a matter of realising that there's a lot of fucking variables. Yeah. Mm. But if you, if you do, you know, if you want to give it, you know, if someone does need to lose weight and like we sp- uh, spoke about earlier, a lot of people to tell them to eat less doesn't, doesn't you know, a lot of people don't want to go on diets. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't want to eat less. One of the simplest things they can do first off is change their method of cooking it can be as simple as that just changing your method of cooking eat the same food if you want Mm. change the method of cooking turn it into resistant starch that will be a good first step where it's not that big a deal yeah second step could be 
then it's starting to shift your proteins and your carbs and your fats, getting it more in, in kind of like a balanced ratio or, mm. you know. Um, amazing. And where does this leave the whole calorie thing? Do you count calories now or not? What do we do? Oh, look, I, my, I've got a life. I don't have time to count <laughs> calories. <laughs> You've got a life. Uh, it's a weird one. I mean, I would, but I, I would, I would. Because it's a matter you want to know where you're at. Yeah. So I, I still want to know what's going on to yeah. a certain degree. Because when someone goes, "Geez, I, I reckon we'll drop those calories by twenty percent," mm. I need to know how to do that to a certain degree. I can't just look at my food and go, "Oh, I'll eat twenty no, percent yeah. less," which, because it doesn't which, do that. Which yeah. calories? Yeah. Well, that's fats. right. So it, it would be a process of experimental process. I, I think it's important to measure and it's important to monitor because that's what you can manage. Mm. Yeah. If you haven't collected the data, then you still a lot of variables. But just don't put too much, you know, aggression and passion behind those numbers because they don't actually mean anything. Mm. They're mm. all just a starting point. And like we, we used to say this with other forms of measurement, we do it. It may not be an accurate measurement, but should accurately be able to measure change. Exactly. So if we can accurately measure change and know if we're heading in the right direction or the wrong direction, then we know whether to make change. We know what is this as a positive adaptation or not. Mm. Um, so I don't think – I think the purpose of today's podcast really was just to show that it, it is complicated. No mm. one really knows everything. Anyone out there that claims to be – dead set understand this thing has not got to that point of knowledge yet where they realize they don't know everything mm. you know and uh, they may not even be reading or keeping up to date they may just be practice makes permanent yeah. you know doing the same thing every day look we know, we know exercise you know? works it seems that protein is a little bit we can maybe able to increase that a bit, bit. does yeah. break the rules a bit we know that that it doesn't matter how often you eat it's, it's, it's more of a case of maybe just eating when you're hungry. See, even those no, other alcohols and starches, they, yeah. they still – carbohydrates, fats, yeah. those alcohols, modified starches, that, those all things are – they still like fuels. Yes. Mm. You know, the, the protein yeah. just seems to be not – like that it just seems to be on its own it, it's it, an it emergency fuel yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and it won't be used it'll be used in the body first and then it, to make it into a fuel is a pain in the ass it's hmm. like you know you get more calories burning it than you, you know, make it into a fuel than you do so there's really some general rules of thumb there microbiome makes a huge difference massive people difference mm. oh, and i'm glad you said that because i said earlier i never got to finish but i mentioned there's some anti-nutrient compounds in plants mm. but those sort of things are usually corrected by the microbiome yeah. yep. um, so good healthy gut health which plants definitely contribute to a good healthy yep, gut flora that good healthy gut flora can help you process those plants more efficiently yep so it might take Proteins. a little while eh? so Wrong. the guys that have gone from high animal to over to plants they might get a bit of farts and that for a bit until their body changes around the microbiome to be a microbiome designed to take protein out of plants it's incredible. And you mentioned fats before. Trans fats are the real bad ones. And the yeah. other ones mm. are, like you said, MCTs. But they're really not good. food anymore, trans fats. No, that's so not. It's a modified, chemically yeah. produced fat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a bio they don't exist. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even mm. classify it as a food. We, we only no. have in nature the cis form, which is the, and the, the trans form is when the, the, the molecules reversed anyway. Mm. They just don't exist in nature. So we've got to be careful of trans fats. Um, refined carbohydrates, I think we all agree on, is, is, is a bit of a no-no. Hmm. We, oh, we agree but then that I'd use it in the gut stuff. Oh yeah, you could, <clears throat> so yeah. when I do the gut protocols, I yeah. always go for the <clears throat> simple, simple sugars, sugars just to go. But then again, you could also do that with low carb. Yeah, you, know, you could achieve the same sort of thing with low carb. And, and and we've got these sort of general rules, but they they can be broken. I mean, calories don't. No, they have to be broken because they're just rules anyway. Yeah. But this is just I don't know if it makes sense. Ah, it's tricky. It just it just brings me out with something that is so variable. Not mm. it just. The amount of variability within each one of those macronutrients mm. and then the overlap between them and then if you consider how much variation we're going to get individuals and then we consider the microbiome is going to get it first anyway. Yep. Like this mm. is – like with so many variables and so much bizarre stuff going on, for anyone to be so confident that there's a certain amount of calories we're going to do mm. and that we're going to manipulate it. And anyone that talks about sugars and sweeteners and insulin and hormones and all that sort of stuff is a scamming misleader. It's a simple concept of eat less than you're going to burn and yeah. you're going to be fine. It's just like we all know that. We all know to lose fat you eat less or yeah. burn more yeah, so it's not than wrong. you eat. But no. we, that it's also is not right. 100% correct. We're just saying it's, there's a lot of discussion around that. <laughs> you know, and, and it's okay to have that discussion. It's In fact, it's good because there's some people out there that aren't getting the results they deserve that might actually pick up on one of these and go, oh, of course. Of course. My coach eats resistant starch. I eat steamed rice. And, that and, alone could be enough. 
It could be. And, yeah. and you've got to you got to think of compliance because we're humans. We're yeah. free living. You know, so you've got to make sure the, the human is, is eaten enough so they don't go to Macca's on the way home, to, you know, straight after breakfast and eat again. Yeah, or so go you, into starvation mode even worse. Exactly. We, don't, we don't want RT3 to go up, which is, we haven't talked about in this yeah. podcast, but it's a bad thyroid hormone. And we don't want the metabolism to drop because you feel awful. Yeah. So we want to keep the calories up. But which calories and what amount, it's just a massive grey area, it is. isn't it? And, and no one studies. knows, it's just plain trial and error. So. Um, so millions of studies and they all point to different areas and it, it, it's really fascinating. And anyway, um, on, that's on, a silly on, on that note, I think we've got to sort of wrap it up. Oh, absolutely. Today, and because it's running late, Brooke is running. asleep, Vanessa's yeah. got the shit. Yeah. I think we should stop. So, so any other final thoughts? No, Steve, just we just said it. it's time You've to stop. stop. All right. Well, <laughs> final no thought. final thought. Done. Well, well thanks, for, thanks for listening We're still and thanks talking. for watching. I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. It's been a fantastic uh, hour for us. And we'll see you all next week with another fantastic topic. So bye for now. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>